Back in Sheffield, I think it was, around about 1977, Ian and I began to get a bit more serious about making music and forming a proper band. So I called on my old school friend, who was Phil Oakey. It soon became apparent, as soon as we started writing proper songs as opposed to conceptual pieces, um, that we needed to find a, a lead singer. We got Phil in only because he was my old mate from school and he got a daft lopsided haircut. Uh, I didn't know whether he could sing or not. It's no a, idea. It's a fine reason to get someone in the band. Well, it is it? really. So we played in the backing track to Being Boiled and we thought as a test, we'd, we'd say, do you want to take this away and see if you can write a melody to it and, uh, and, the, and some lyrics? He came back a couple of days later and played it for, and sang it for us, and he's going, listen to the voice of Buddha. And I'm going, what the hell are you talking about? It turns out that it was all about um, boiling silk, young silkworms uh, uh, as a kind of uh, allegory of the way that parents treat their children. Um, I think he was a bit angry with his parents for some reason at that point. Anyway, we loved what he did, and he got the job. Listen to the voice of Buddha. The name The Human League came from uh, a board game that, that we had called uh, Star Force. And he played it with little cardboard counters and it was a bit rubbish. But the description of the different scenarios had some very interesting ideas in it. So one of them was called the popularity of the pan-sentient hegemony. And we thought that's probably a bit long-winded for the name of a band. Uh, but then there was uh, uh, one scenario that was called the rise of the human league. And I had spotted this and I thought that is such a great name for a band. The start of the Human League, I mean, it was very, very exciting because it, it was almost like, um, you know, one minute they were playing around with a four-track uh, recorder, tape recorder, and then almost within a few months, there they were up there on the front cover of uh, uh, New Musical Express, My Mate. Humanly were, you know, so perfectly bound up with the atmosphere and energy of the times because, you know, they're, they're coming out of um, Sheffield, so they've got their own kind of um, soundscape behind them, you know, the, the whole kind of uh, steel thing. The, it was definitely Yorkshire, you know, it was bloody minded and it was stubborn and it was, uh, no language was wasted and all that kind of thing, but it was futuristic too, so they had a science fiction thing, so it was, it was just incredibly um, alluring. The, strange combinations of, uh, of influences and, and desires. Although we had great critical success with the first two Human League albums, they didn't actually sell as well as the record company hoped. So the way it was building up is the third album was very much make or break. You know, the game was always to get on top of the pops and have a hit and prove that you could put this sort of way of thinking and way of making music into the mainstream. So when those first two albums failed to have a real hit, I think there was a lot of soul-searching within the band. And, and it was driven very much from within the band, but it was frustrating to all concerned, some more than others. Then after this fantastic excitement, and the Human League got fantastic reviews, I remember reading, you know, David Bowie went to one of their gigs and said, this is the sound of the future. It was very, very exciting. So 1979, the Human League started to fall, fall out. And, uh, and I think Martin was, you know, was, was, really, was really quite down because, you know, this was his dream to be in a band to record albums and to make music, which he'd done. And it all started to fall apart. It was an, it was an odd situation because it kind of all got a little bit out of hand. There was an increasing number of kind of niggly arguments between myself and Phil in particular. Um, but that's just locking horns, you know, at that age, it's like, who's the alpha male, you know, the lead singer or the guy who formed the group, you know. It wasn't that pleasant, really. What I didn't realise is that behind the scenes, Bob Last and presumably the record company as well, had, been, had already come to this conclusion that it wasn't going to work and that they were secretly destabilising the band by dropping words into, into Phil's ear. That, you know, he should be the big star 
and uh, they needed more. You need it needed more of a vehicle for for straightforward pop. Two of the most uh, charismatic, annoying, talented, fractious, big-headed people that you could have the pleasure of meeting were in one band. We never really got to the bottom of why, of, of how the split mechanisms happened, and and, I, and we were thinking maybe it was Virgin who were frankly pissed off because we'd not earned enough money, right? And we were losing them money. Yeah. Uh, but um, what do you think? I th I thought that it, looking back, and it took me a while to see. It, I thought it was probably Bob Last, and I thought he'd said something like. That, that having the two of us in a group was, was too much. Mm, yeah, it did probably. That I think we're both, we're, we're both quite stubborn, or were quite stubborn yeah. at the time. My take was I got so fed up with them bickering, I thought that they were going to possibly just split apart completely. And I thought that would be a shame. And as it became clear it wasn't sustainable, I was sort of putting jigsaw pieces in my head to see what would work. And uh, I wasn't throwing flames on the fire, but when both factions started talking to me, I, uh, I thought, OK, here's an interesting opportunity to actually encourage this and turn it into something constructive. Just turned up at the studio one day and said, we're throwing you out of the group, Martin. And uh, I said, I don't think so, it's my group. What I found very suspicious was that immediately the split happened, he kind of whisked me off and, and, and gave me this idea for the British Electric Foundation. Right. And it's like, I thought, he can't have just thought that up on the spur of the right. moment. Yeah. He must have been playing this for a yeah. while. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But I check, I still quite like him. Oh, I like him. I like him a lot, yeah. Sometimes I did things that allowed things to happen that might well have happened anyway. Um, but having said that, yeah, I did engineer a split. It's, it's hard to, to realise how much a shock it was at the time. It sounds daft now, the idea of a pop group splitting up. Uh, almost, for those of us who knew the Human League, it did have the quality of the Beatles splitting up. It was a, it was a very peculiar moment. Well, of course, I was extremely upset at the time, as you can imagine. Because not only was, you know, we were very close as a band, but Phil had been my best friend for, like, years before that also. After the shock had subsided, after a couple of hours, uh, literally that evening, I just rang Glenn. You came up to Sheffield. It just, again, that was fortuitous that I just happened to come up on the day that you had that big round. Yeah, I'd already, I, I'd already knew what I wanted there. Did you? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, no, I, I, you weren't going to say no, I knew that. No. It's kind of like proposing to somebody when you know they're going to say yes. It's a bit of a fait accompli, <laughs> really. I don't think I even thought about it longer than it took me to say yes. You know, uh, it was an instant yes, definitely. This building here was the Red Lion where Martin asked me to marry him and join Heaven 17. <laughs> that, was that was the pub. That was it, yeah. It was the Red Lion, it's no, now it's... called Flares. And then he said... It was very, a very beautiful thing, and within two weeks, we'd, no, less than ten days, we'd record a flashy screw thing. Yeah. Out of the blue, and it was like a big supernova of creativity. I was massively motivated. I mean, I've never been so motivated to do anything uh, 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 like this, uh, ever, ever since, actually. It's the biggest motivation you could possibly imagine. I was on fire. I'll show the world what the real deal is here. You could see his, his attitude and his demeanour change. Almost, well, no, overnight. Suddenly, he's got a new band, and the old Martin that I knew, who was constantly inventive, constantly creative, and uh, constantly enthusiastic about things, were, you know, was, was back. Ian had also decided to come with me, which is really important, I think, and we took the decision to form a production company, the British Electric Foundation, and the idea was to have a load of projects, and the first one happened to be him.